generations to come. Welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News and a fan of the hottest team in baseball, the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> you knew that was going to slide in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, I'm Randy Moss with NBC Sports and the Buyer Speed Figure team. T.D. Thornton speaking to you from a little bit north of Boston today, and I am a stablemate <laughs> of Bills at Thoroughbred Daily News. Yeah, well, lots going on this week, especially with Saratoga getting ready to run. But let's take a look back at some of the more interesting races from last weekend. And there was a ton. I picked out three that I wanted to talk about. And Randy, we, we kid you of having so many favorite horses. Well, I'm going to, um, I, I have, everyone knows Bookham Dano's number one, but I have a number two. So I have two favorite horses. And that's next. And I think he's such a cool story. He went off and hit, did what he always does in the Brooklyn at a mile and three eighths. He won by the length of the stretch. Uh, in his last five starts, he's been first by a co uh, combined margin of 56 and three quarter lengths. Likely the Birdstone stakes at San, it's not, excuse me, of course, not at Santa Anita at Saratoga is next. But I bring up the same subject I brought up before. Please try this horse in the Jockey Club Gold Cup or against more conventional horses. I mean, the horse only made 110000 winning the Brooklyn. You, you would win that finishing, you would make that much money finishing third in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. I, all right, well, I have a difference of opinion here. I, I wouldn't do it. I would do exactly like Doug Cowens is doing and exactly like owner Michael Foster is doing. Because to me, uh, the past performances of next are are just cut and dried. I mean, it tells you what he wants to do. Uh, leading into the uh, Cape Henlopen, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it or not, uh, race at Delaware Park in September of 2022, when Cowan's first decided to stretch the horse out to a mile and a half. Okay, going into that race, next had won only two of his previous ten starts. Since then. Since they stretched him out, which has enabled him to sort of, uh, you know, go at his own kind of loping pace early and not be pressed and can be up there close to the pace and not drop too far behind. It turned out to be just the perfect scenario for Nest and se or Next. And since then, he's won seven of his eight starts at either a mile and a half or a mile and three quarters or a mile and three eighths. Uh, by an average winning margin of 12 lengths. He's been a completely different horse since they stretched him out to what we would call marathon distances in America. And, you know, I mean, I, 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 I get it uh, that why people, you know, want, want to see, uh, something else from next. But uh, to me, uh, I feel like Doug Cowens does. I mean, let's enjoy what this horse does. There's not a dirt horse in the world who can outrun this horse at a mile and a half or thereabouts. And that's his specialty. And I see no reason to try to force him to do something that he's shown that he doesn't really want to do. All right. Let me throw one more sure. uh, thought at you. Okay. And I, I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, but how about trying him in a mile and a half grass race? You know, might that be the, you know, the Breeders' Cup turf? You know, it, it, he, I, I believe he's run on the turf in the past. I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. But, you know, there's. I would just like to see them experiment. Give them one shot of doing something a little bit outside the box. It doesn't work. You go back and you win, you know, the, these long distance races. But um, he would get that same sort of pace scenario in, say, like the turf classic that he he seems to like so much. Or the sword. I, if, if I owned him, I'd run him in the sword dancer next. That would be my spot. Yeah. That's not beyond the realm. Yeah. <clears throat> and from a buyer speed figure perspective, Randy, th this this must be some sort of a record here. He's had seven races at a mile and three eighths or longer, and he's cracked triple digits every, every single one. Um, I, 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 I was entertained just looking back through Next's past performances, and I wasn't initially aware that he started out for trainer Wesley Ward, yeah. who is a crackerjack trainer getting horses to win sprint distances early. He was a beaten favorite first time out going four and a half furlongs at Woodbine. <laughs> And he even ran in the uh, the 2020 Breeders' Cup Juvenile. He finished last. He didn't beat a horse, but I believe he's still the only horse out of that race still competing. And they claimed him from Wesley Ward and Silverton Hill for 62500 And he ran for 50000 claiming for these connections, just two races or the, his very next start, actually, uh, which he won uh, on the turf 
as Bill mentioned, he won on the turf at a mile and an eighth. But, I mean, this is just a remarkable horse, and it's amazing to see him do what he's doing. Yeah, it's it's a really cool story, and I'm not going to poo-poo anything that he's accomplished because Source is doing things that are uh, very special. And uh, we'll keep watching him in these uh, marathon uh, events. I guess the Birdstone is – I think that's a mile and seven-eighths or something like that, that race. Yeah. Mile but, and you, four, yeah. you know what's really truly amazing about this horse is that all of us who have cut our – teeth on dirt racing throughout the years. You know, we know that when you get in a two-turn race, even at the very top level stakes race, right? If you're going a mile and a 16th, a mile and an eighth, it's great at a mile and a quarter. If you can finish the last quarter mile in 24 seconds, right? 24 and change is a super fast closing fraction on dirt for top, top horses going long. Next, just ran a mile and three eighths in the Brooklyn. He ran his his uh, penultimate, his next to last furlong in 11.88. He ran his final furlong in 11.89. He came home in 23.77 wow. seconds at a mile and three eighths. And then he galloped out like a fiend when he crossed the wire. If he'd gone a mile and a half, he probably would have gone in 224 and change. Right. I mean, it's unbelievable what this horse has done since they've stretched him out. Yeah, great story. So let's go out to Southern California where they had the Great Lady M stakes on Saturday at Los Alamitos. And I wanted to bring this up because uh, this is a horse that's certainly flown under the radar, but maybe not anymore. Sweet Azteca two starts ago beat uh, Adair Manor in the Beholder, the grade one. But still all the talk was about Adair Manor and Idiomatic and whatnot. Uh, trainer Michael McCarthy switched her back to a six and a half furlong race at Los Alamitos. She wins by five and one fourteen and Point three three for six and a half furlongs sets a track record. Uh, she's got to be talked about, I think, in the same breath right now with the, the very best mayors in her division, Randy. Oh yeah, I mean Adair Manor is obviously one of the very best in her division. After a sweet Azteca beat her in the Beholder Mile, sweet uh, Adair Manor went on to win the Apple Blossom at Oaklawn Park. I know uh, for getting you know getting ready for NBC's coverage on Kentucky Derby Week. Uh, they were initially uh, wanting to bring Sweet Azteca to Churchill Downs to run on, uh, on in one of the undercard stakes, but she had a little minor setback, and so she didn't make it. But, I mean, this was, you know, again, a step forward for Sweet Azteca, 106 buyer speed figure. I mean, she looked absolutely dominant. I, I still don't know if she's going to be better than Adair Manor, let's say, or uh, idiomatic, you know, going like a mile and an eighth on dirt in the Breeders' Cup distaff. The Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint, I think, might wind up being a better spot. But, hey, I mean, she just, you know, she's run a mile and beat Adair Manor, and she's obviously in top form. Connections have said they'll nominate her practically everywhere. And uh, one of the likely landing spots, though, could be the grade one ballerina at Saratoga. That's a seven eighths race on the 24th of August or 24th of, uh, yes, August. Another race that caught my attention over the weekend and for the wrong reasons is the Dwyer stakes at Belmont. And I've been saying for some time now that Naira needs to get rid of some stakes races. This race this year attracted a four horse field won by domestic product paid 340. Last year, Fort Bragg, six horse field 340. Year before that, charge it six horse, six horse field 320. Uh, 2021, five horse field, 280, not run in 2020 because of COVID. In 2019, six horse field, 430. Naira has a couple races like this that just basically don't serve any purpose anymore. I mean, if you got rid of the Dwyer, nobody would miss it. Take that money, spread it around over an overnight or add it to extra the stakes money. Um, and you know, it's, it's not, um, they shouldn't, they shouldn't want to. Be put themselves in a situation where they're likely going to get four or five horses for, for one of these races. And I know they're kind of out of the way racetracks, but one of the problems was on that weekend, that same day, Prairie Meadows had their Iowa Derby and Canterbury had their Minnesota Derby. So there was three derbies all, none of them were for, you know, are going to attract the triple crown type horses. They're all going to attract the, the second string horses. And that's exactly what happened. I think that it would make so much sense that, you know, I'm not talking about getting rid of 20 races, but there are four or five races on the Naira calendar that have just become obsolete. 
And I just think it's time to put the Brookline, now, the Dwyer, I know the Dwyer's probably been run for you know, 120 years or something, but it's time has come and gone. Put it out of its misery. Well, I, you know, you can start with the Dwyer and then you're going to have to start looking at other other four and five and six horse stakes races. It's, it, I don't think the, the, the problem is limited to just the Dwyer. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, and it's not limited to just Naira. And talking about the Dwyer itself and what we saw in the Dwyer from domestic product, uh, it was a remarkable win, a very, very eye-catching win for this horse who was basically, you know, side by side with Hades, who's a decent horse at the top of the stretch. And then with a very impressive stride, domestic product just left him behind. A nice, nice turn of foot. Now, the temptation would be, I think anybody that watches this, it was one mile, one turn. You'd say, okay, this is a Travers horse. But when they've run domestic product at longer distances in the past, what you see, if you go back and watch, is a horse that that gets over anxious, that pulls with the rider, that, that you know, the slower paces of the distance races uh, make him a little uh, impatient. And so that's why Chad Brown decided that he wanted to cut him back in distance to one turn. So instead of looking ahead to longer races, he's got Sierra Leone and others already for the Travers. But uh, the Allen Jerkins is now going to be the next target for domestic product. And boy, it looks like uh, he's definitely lined up to be one of the favorites for that. Uh-uh, Bookham Dano's going in that race. Oh, Watch yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The September sale runs from September 9th to the 21st, and the team at Keeneland is preparing for the September sale, and it's no easy task. They will inspect over 2,900 yearlings, travel over 5,000 miles, and visit 338 farms. This weekend alone, the Keeneland September sale produced three graded stakes winners, Mulligan, Warlike Goddess, and Honored Be Lady, the winner of the Del Park Handicap. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Keeneland, a horse will always be measured in hands. Hands that see, that sense, that speak. Hands that hold our sport to a higher standard, not for our sake, but for theirs, for the love of the horse, for generations to come. The Fastest Horse of the Week is brought to you this week by Nashville, one of the fastest of the many fast sires at Windstar Farm. After all, in Nashville's career debut, he ran six and a half furlongs and won 14.48 and became a TD and Rising Star. He followed that up with the fastest six furlongs of that Keeneland Fall Meet, 109.10, to win an allowance by almost 10 lengths. He topped that by setting the six furlong track record at Keeneland, 107.89, on the Breeders' Cup undercard faster than the Breeders' Cup sprint later that same day, by the way. And at the fairgrounds, Nashville ran the fastest six furlongs of the 21-22 winter meet, 108.61 seconds. That means Nashville is pretty fast. And he was pretty fast in the breeding shed, too, where he has been so far. He bred 204 mares in his first book, 91% of those mares getting into full. Nashville's first weanlings will sell this fall. So while Nashville specialized in, braz- in blazing sprint speed, our fastest horse of the week specializes in what we in America would call marathon distances. We've already talked about him. His name is Next. And in that Brooklyn Stakes win, buyer speed figure, career high, 109. A well-deserved fastest horse of the week. Nod to Next. The TD and Riders Room has long been affiliated with the Green Group, the sponsor of this weekly segment. The Green Group is an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm that has a fondness for and a special expertise in helping those in the thoroughbred industry. And now, the Green Group Guest of the Week. We welcome in now the Green Group Guest of the Week. And what, who else do we have? on right before Saratoga, but the CEO and president of the New York Racing Association, Dave O'Rourke. Dave, thanks so much for spending some time with us. And it looks like you've already got a little smile on your face. you got a couple days to go before opening day, and uh, uh, it looks like everybody's pretty excited about what we hope will be a great meet. Yeah, no, uh, actually having the Belmont up here, so it's actually a, it's a calmer week than usual setting up, uh, place ready to go. Um, you know, it looks like it might get a little bit of rain on Thursday, but the weekend's looking clear so far. 
Dave, the, the, one of the big stories, and perhaps the biggest story of the meet last year, were, were the breakdowns. And, um, you know, nobody's pointing any fingers at Naira. We know how hard you guys try to keep the horses safe. But could you go through in 2024 what's in place? What can you guys do to make sure? I mean, I'm not going to say you're going to get a zero, but make sure you have as few fatalities as possible. Uh, well, you know, last year, I mean, you got to remember how rare these are, specifically the, the ones on the dirt last year. Like that was uh, like statistically such an anomaly, but um, you know, a high octane sport, uh, you have to like safety has to be number one. So in terms of the tracks, the tracks have just been tested. Actually, Mick Peterson was just out here. They all look good. The feedback's been very good. The weather coming into this meet is a, is near not nearly as uh, wet, for lack of a better term, as last year. And you know the Heiser protocols they've been refined. There's been some changes on the. Uh, specifically injectables for one in terms of timelines coming into this meet. And I think, uh, I think you're seeing that. And it's not just, uh, you're seeing that from the industry as a whole rolling into it through the triple crown. I think you're really starting to see the, uh, the effects of having a unified um, structure here for safety. So, oh, so before, but before we move on, one more <clears throat> one more question on that topic uh, in the recent uh, news blurb about uh, about Naira trying to standardize the racing, the dirt racing surfaces across all all three of your racetracks. Uh, I noticed in the news article the statistic about the uh, the safety rate of Saratoga and Oklahoma and how low it was compared to the average nationally and compared even to like Belmont Park. Um, how encouraging is that? It is, and in our circuit, those those have been. You know, over the last over the recent history, the safest tracks that we have on here, um, they're specific in that they have a clay pad over the base. Uh, Belmont was a clay track, and the outer, the original outer uh, main track at Aqueduct were built that way. So there were summer and spring tracks like traditionally were built that way. They kind of have a little bit more bounce. They're easier to keep the moisture levels consistent, and um, that's what we intend to put in at Belmont. And you know, as part of that, that does. Um, Relating to running on the all all weather in the winter, because you can't put salt in a track like that. Yeah, so there's there are limitations. There's really good, and then the the downside would be you can't use it in every condition. So we're we're trying to get the best surfaces for the the conditions that would be present during when we're running on. Dave, with the announcement that uh, as of 2026, the the winter racing portion of the season at Nairo will we'll be moving over to an all tapita surface. Um, I, I don't think there was any. Uh, resistance from the horsemen from having a tapita surface but there seemed to be a little pushback not everybody was quite on board with it being the only surface in the winter uh can you just give us an overview of of why a dirt track and a tapita surface can't coexist in the winter well it depends if you want the best of both worlds and, and that's what we want in terms of uh safety and the surface uh you can't have a clay base or a clay pad over the base and put salt in the track. So you're not going to be able to use that track during freezing conditions in the winter. And if you look at the all weather surfaces, it's essentially designed for winter use and for, uh, for inclement weather. So it just, if you're, if you're trying to apply the tech of today, I mean, the tech in the seventies uh, was a dirt track with a limestone base. And they actually built a second one at Aqueduct to do that. And, you know, Roughly 50 years later, we're approaching this and we're, we're using the best materials that are available. Tapita has been around for a long time. It's, it's tried and tested at this point. And um, it's change. Um, it, it is change. And, you know, there, there's, um, there, we are getting feedback on it, but there's just no way for us to have the best of both worlds to run through the winter. And with our sport, the high octane sport, as I mentioned earlier, safety is number one. We're going to put down the, uh, the tracks that we feel give us the best opportunity to have a safe event. Dave, if you had a Tapita track at Saratoga last year, you would have obviously had better handle because so many of the races that got washed off the turf. You had 65 races came off the turf last year. And we, as we've seen at Gulfstream, when these races come off the turf, they move them to Tapita, they lose very few horses and, and it's a better product for the betters and better for the racetrack. Um, I'm, I can't imagine where you would put it or how you would do it, but is there any chance you could shoehorn a Tapita track in at Saratoga? Um, we are looking at um, engineering to see what it would look like. Uh, I don't, I haven't seen that exactly, but you would think it'd be on the inside, obviously, like a seven right. track. You'd widen the actual outer turf course, 
but then you're, you might be limiting your turf program, but in other ways you might be extending it because you can come off it and you're not throwing up the, tur the turf in uh, foul weather. Um, that's in discussion. It's very early on. Um, that's a big change for up here. Uh, it would have to be done right, uh, obviously. Um, we don't have tunnels. Tunnels would be a little bit of a challenge because of the water table. But, um, yeah, that is a conversation, Bill, to answer your question. Because in terms of, you know, we were talking about the, the winter, but the off-the-turf aspect of the Tapita is obviously another huge bonus. Um, I don't see us carting the three surfaces in tandem at any point, at least not right now. That's not in any of our plans. So, Dave, as you look ahead now to this Saratoga meet and you sit down in your office with your spreadsheets and you try to uh, you try to project exactly what the business is going to be like, how encouraging was it the reception that you got from that special Belmont Stakes meeting at Saratoga? It was amazing, actually. Uh, it was in, it was incredible. It, um, you know, in terms of uh, that really sets up some momentum rolling into the meet. And it really is just about it's, you know, at, at the core of this, it's an entertainment product. And the fans up here are so bought in. Uh, we're looking for amazing crowds. Uh, television, it, there's just so many aspects to this in terms of really throwing a party for 40 days when you get down to it. Uh, everyone has so much fun up here. We just hope it stays dry. I mean, that's always the, uh, the challenge with Saratoga is, is the one thing you can't control is the weather. Dave, the, um, you know, th that mini meet at Saratoga, so to speak, the Belmont Stakes Festival, it, it was a necessity this year and next year because of the reconstruction that's going on at Belmont Park. And uh, by most accounts, it was a rousing success. And even though it was a necessity because of the construction, it also, in a way, might have been a little bit of a trial balloon for what happens post-2026 when eventually Belmont Park, the new one, and Saratoga are going to be the only venues left in, in Naira's stable. I know in the past you've been reluctant to answer this question when we've put it to you, but we're going to ask you again. What is the post-2026 Naira schedule going to look like now that you've seen what a mini-meet at Saratoga can do? Should we expect roughly 10 months at Belmont and the same 40 days at Saratoga, or would the, there be a possibility for another mini-meet or festival? I mean, that's, that's always in discussion because there is interest in that. Even uh, some board members have brought that up. But at the moment, it's you know, it's 10 and two, like you said, there's nothing definitive, but that is something that is discussed. I mean, you can't deny there is an attraction to it. Um, even running the 4th of July downstate, you sort of feel like some people are waiting out to go to Saratoga. So does it make sense? So th this is an ongoing discussion, but at the moment, the way we've mapped it out or forecasted, nothing's changing. And anything that does change, there's going to be a lot of dialogue before. So it's not going to be a surprise. That's for sure. So when you when you guys talk about mini meets, right? I mean, I know one of the reasons I mean, they're more than just this, but one of the benefits of uh, the remodeling of Belmont Park is that you could have the Breeders' Cup back at Belmont Park for the first time in a long time. Uh, Saratoga is not that far north of Elmont, New York. I mean, would it could it be possible that a mini meet in the future might include a Breeders' Cup at Saratoga? It's worth a conversation. I'd have to look at the historical weather records on that one because <laughs> it's definitely there's a difference between Queens and upstate here, uh, specifically that time of year. Uh, would it be interesting? Of course. Uh, do I think uh, in terms of the weather risk, uh, it's probably a long shot. Right. Yeah, that question, by the way, was asked by somebody who lives in Minnesota who gets psyched <laughs> by 48 degrees. Hey. So that's, that's Brandy's perspective. Uh, moving yeah. back to late October and have it at Saratoga. Yeah. Yeah. And there will not be a Breeders' Cup at Canterbury Park, I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah. um, Dave, I think one of the things that has made uh, Saratoga so special, and I'm going to link this to Fenway Park, who is, I'm a huge Red Sox fan. I go up there. Uh, both the Boston Red Sox and in the same respects, Naira, you've been able to keep the tradition and the history and, you know, going back to the 1800s for you guys and Fenway Park goes back to 1912, but at the same time, bringing in modern amenities and making it, even though it's a track that's been around for more than a hundred years, seem modern. Um, has that been a, a difficult balancing act? Last five, six years or so, you take your time. Like uh, specifically, you walk the plant, you look at where the activity is, you look at things that could be refreshed. Then you talk to the architects and the historical society up here and how you might approach that. 
So, you know, since the 1863, I think what you, well, I know what you've seen up here is kind of like small evolution in spots. And we're, we're really like, this is a jewel. And even going back to the tapita and, and would you put one in here? Like anything that you do to touch this place needs to be so well thought out, mm -hmm. communicated, and you want the feedback. Um, I think the Jim Dandy bar came out really cool. I think people are going to enjoy that this summer. It looks good. We changed the orientation, like really on the first floor of the clubhouse. Uh, the paddock suite or the tree house would be the other one. That one looks like it could have been here for 50, 60 years already. So there's a few more things we'd like to do. But we're just taking our time. You know, like that's really all you have to, you have to really think it through. Uh, Dave, shifting back downstate to Belmont, please bring us up to date on uh, what's been completed so far. What are the next major phases? And are you still on target to to host the 2026 Belmont Stakes there? Still on target. The uh, the building's almost down, so we haven't really gotten into the construction. So, I mean, obviously ordering the materials and procurement, but the building's coming down. The track work's really been what's been progressing in terms of like seeing like finished products start to come together. Now, you're not seeing a turf course yet, but the amount of infrastructure that's going in with uh, drainage, dry wells, irrigation systems, uh, it's phenomenal what's going on there in terms of the size of the infrastructure with the tunnels into the infield. Uh, it's really cool. I mean, that's something that's probably worth a story on its own because not very often do you get to see one is essentially the largest track in the States. Right. Um, and then it's being built from the ground up and we're adding a new uh, Tapita track. So to really just see the infrastructure lay down and what goes into services, modern services today, it's pretty, it's, it's cool. And uh, I give all the credit to Glenn Kozak. Uh, we just got to pull them out of there now and bring them up north for a few months. Mm -hmm. So you uh, mentioned that Belmont, that uh, Saratoga is like a 40 day party. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I know it's worth it. But how exhausting is it for you and for the people that are in the management at Saratoga that, you know, have to go through that every single day at the end of the meet? Are you just like completely wiped? It was easier when I was younger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's it's a it's a rough haul. I mean, we're five days now, not six. That that's a that was a big change. They actually get a day off in that sense for the the crew here. Uh, but yeah, it's it's you listen here at Naira, we don't stop. I mean, we're running all year round. There really isn't a break. And you know, folks that come in here from other places, like it, it's you got to get your wind. It's not. It's a very long year. So, uh, yeah, this is the highlight of it, though. This is the most fun, really, when you get down to it. Actually, from the Belmont, this whole, like, summer season, once you start with the Belmont mm -hmm. and the Triple Crown coming through Labor Day, it's the high point. If you're not having fun now, you don't you don't belong in order. Dave, knocking Saratoga is kind of like knocking Santa Claus, but Chad Brown did it nonetheless in an interview he gave to the Horse Racing Nation website. And his argument was that there are just too many cheap races. A guy like him with the better horses is not even going to be competing in at least half the races in there. Um, you know, there was a day and age when, you know, we didn't see $20,000 claimers at Saratoga, but I understand you've had to expand the meet. But, uh, A, did you read that column and, and what was your reaction to it? Yeah, I saw it. And I don't know exactly what the context was to begin because it sounded like it was a conversation that was captured, sort of. Um, you know, the first thing I actually spoke with Andrew here, head of racing, and we pulled the last few years, like last, actually all the way back to 2009, really. And uh, I'm not exactly seeing what he's saying, at least in the last mm -hmm. five years. I mean, I don't know if you are. Uh, we had less claiming races last year than the year before. But really what it comes down to is racing is an ecosystem. There's small trainers all the way up to the largest ones like Chad. Everyone deserves an opportunity to run. And it's really important that some of these smaller train outfits get that chance up here and, and owners. Uh, it's an experience. It brings people into the sport. Like with the television product, one of the greatest things is if we can capture somebody who's got a horse in for the first time and get them on camera. Like, and that really just adds to the ownership experience, stuff like that. So, um, you know, I just politely disagree. I think it's a good thing to spread it out and give everyone opportunities. Yes. We want to have some of the top stakes in the country, if not the top in this period of time. But um, you got to fill the cards and, and you got to have balance in an ecosystem. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's that. There's the there's the business perspective of field size. True. Right? I mean, field size is so important. And you know that 
if the if the racing office could, they would write a lot more allowance races if they could get nine, 10, 11, 12 horse fields in all of them. But realistically, nowadays in horse racing, that just it just doesn't happen. I mean, we can go down and talk about full crop size, available inventory. Yeah. But this is all ratios, right, Randy? I mean, there's ratios on what horses are going to fit where. You can move the ratio slightly, but it's only going to go so far. So, um, yeah, no, we're the Saratoga is top product in the U.S. It's uh, it's going to stay the top product, obviously, and uh, there's going to be balance in it. That's just what it is. Dave, back to the uh, the overarching plan downstate. Mm-hmm. I, I think we, we in the media are guilty a little bit of taking it as a given that Aqueduct is just going to vanish and go away uh, once the new Belmont is up and running. Uh, but is that accurate? Is is there go? You know, what is the is the end game from Aqueduct going on behind the scenes? Are you planning for that, or should we expect a little bit of an overlap time, maybe in twenty six, twenty seven? when all three tracks are still under the Naira umbrella and, the, and they're all still operational or is it, it, or has that been decided and etched in stone and there is an end date for Aqueduct? I mean, the actual, consider this in, in uh, 26, when we leave, come back from Saratoga, essentially that would be the point where you hand the keys back, if not before. Um, you know, this is part, and it's really, it's actually very positive in terms of uh, the state, you know, giving back about 100, 110 acres at Aqueduct for development use for the state in terms of the economic equation for getting Belmont built. That's, that's a big part of it. It's about a billion dollars worth of real estate sitting next to Kennedy airport. Um, we think there's really good use for it. And we're going to have a, you know, four brand new tracks and a new building at Belmont. That's our primary training center downstate. So the, the, this equation made sense economically. And that was a big component of how it makes sense. Well, Dave O'Rourke, I uh, want to thank you so much for spending some time with us. And uh, we, I won't wish you good luck at the meet. I'll wish you lots of sunny skies and no rain at this meet. Boy, did we see what, what the impact that was last year. But uh, uh, I'm sure Saratoga will be a t- great meet this year. And thanks so much for uh, joining us and sharing some of your thoughts. Thanks for having me, guys. For appearing on the TD and Writers Room is the Green Group Guest of the Week, David O'Rourke. will receive a free one-hour tax consultation with Lynn Green and partners at the Green group. In case you didn't know, Lynn is also a thoroughbred owner at the top level of the sport, so he knows what he's talking about when he says he can help you save money on your taxes. To find out more, visit www.greenco.com. When it comes to the horse industry, tax laws are complicated and unique. That is why most people overpay on their taxes. Why not get a second opinion from the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred industry? With over 800 clients in the horse business alone, the Green Group has the expertise to save you taxes. There is a reason the most successful owners, breeders, trainers, vets, and horsemen use the Green Group as their tax advisors. We save you taxes. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with current-edge tax-saving strategies, produces positive tax-saving results for clients. Take advantage of this special offer. The Green Group will give you a complimentary and confidential review of your tax return. Contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. And this segment, T.D. Thornton, I'm glad to have him on because right now he's got the most thankless job at the TDN, trying to make sense of all the lawsuits flying back and forth, the decisions and whatnot about Heiza. And every time something happens, it gets a little bit more crazy. Uh, T.D., first of all, just tell us what was the, give us a synopsis of what you were writing about last week. Well, it wouldn't have been a, uh, a holiday weekend in the racing industry without some Friday holiday news dump. And uh, this one came to us courtesy of the United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. This is the week when we talked a couple of weeks ago about Haiza here on the podcast. We said this is the one that we're waiting for to see what goes forward and how things progress. However, it did muddle the picture a little bit what they said. So the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has this case. It's a lawsuit initiated and led by the national HBPA uh, against basically trying to derail Haiza and uh, and say that the statute is not constitutional. Another appeals court, the Sixth Circuit, has already said Haiza is constitutional. The law, the law meets 
constitutional standards. It got a check mark from the, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, but the law was challenged in the Fifth Circuit Court. And uh, they came back in their ruling and they said, we, we like a lot of what the Sixth Circuit said. We think that the way the rulemaking happens in HISA has been solved by a 2022 constitutional tweak, uh, excuse me, a congressional tweak that, that changed the law and that made the, the HISA authority subordinate to the Federal Trade Commission in terms of rulemaking. They also said in the Friday ruling that just came out that HISA, the law HISA does not violate the due process clause, so it's okay there. However, they diverged from what the Sixth Circuit Court said by bringing up another issue entirely, and they said uh, it does not, the, the rulemaking itself is okay. However, the way that the HISA Act is enforced by the authority violates the private non-delegation doctrine, which is a way of saying that uh, powers to a congressional type of power, uh, constitutional type of powers like this cannot be delegated to a private entity. So now we have a, uh, a scenario where the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals says one thing, the Fifth Circuit says another, and this is the type of case that the Supreme Court of the United States very well might handle. It's, it's what they call a conflict in circuits. Uh, the Supreme Court very often steps in and takes these types of cases just to settle the, what, what is, quote unquote, going to be the law of the land. So now it's up to which side brings it to the Supreme Court. So Katie, if I'm re if I'm reading this right, one thing that really confuses me, it sounds like the Fifth Circuit said, yeah, Heise is OK, it's constitutional, but we're not going to allow him any enforcement powers. Um, I mean, is that fairly accurate? And if so, how does that make any sense? Well, I, I don't know about the making any sense, but I, I think you're onto something there. Um, what our colleague at TDN, Dan Ross, did an interview with Lucinda Finley, who's a, con uh, a constitutional law expert. And her take on this was that, so now we have a set of rules that both appeals courts have, have said is okay, it's constitutionally legal, but the enforcement of those rules is not legal. So what happens? That's the big question right now. We don't know. I don't, I certainly don't know. So clarify for everyone now, uh, how a time, a possible timeline, I mean, how long could it take for the Supreme Court to hear this and what happens to HISA uh, in the interim? So right now in the interim, nothing changes. There is no order that came down that says they have to stop uh, doing what they do on a daily basis. HISA, uh, HISA's chief executive officer, Lisa Lazarus, in the aftermath of the decision, told TDN that, sure, we're disappointed in this outcome. We think there were a lot of strengths in the Sixth Circuit ruling that will hold up at the Supreme Court level if it comes to that. But Lisa also underscored that nothing is going to change on a day-to-day -day basis. So converse to that, the, the winning plaintiffs in the case, the uh, HBPA came out and via press release, they, they announced victory. They said because, because that this aspect of HISA was found to be unconstitutional, they are counting that as a win. And now it's, you know, we'll see if it gets, which side brings it up to the S Supreme Court level. Our constitutional law expert that we interviewed in TDN, Lucinda Finley, seem to indicate that she thinks it will be the HISA authority that will bring this up and elevate the case to the Supreme Court's level. Somebody has to bring it there for the Supreme Court to say, yes, we're going to take this case or we're not. Uh, and Ms. Finley's idea was that the HISA authority should bring the case to the Supreme Court, but only focus on the one narrow aspect of the enforcement um, being uh, unconstitutional in the Fifth Circuit Court and try to get that resolved. And then it would be incumbent upon the HBPA plaintiffs and everybody else who's enjoined on their side of the case to try to bring in other issues that they think should be contested at the Supreme Court level. Supreme Court has pretty much ended its session for the year. They, they run on a calendar that goes from, from October until about this time, late June, early July. So this would have to be a fresh case that, that gets brought to the Supreme Court sometime in the fall, and then they decide whether they want to take it or not. It's a process that will last at the very least through the winter and into next year at this time, and it could drag on even longer. T.D., one thing the Supreme Court did already do was the story before the story, where uh, they asked uh, the, the people and the plaintiffs in the fifth, excuse me, the Sixth Circuit case wanted to appeal, 
And the Supreme Court, with the writ of certiorari is what they called it, said they're not going to take the case. I, I believe you wrote that it was a one, like two word press release. Um, should pro Heise f- uh, factions take, uh, uh, be relieved by the fact that the Supreme Court, though they haven't ruled on it, has kind of tipped, shown their cards a little bit here? Well, yes, yes and no, I think. I mean, no, in that at the time that that ruling came out about three weeks ago, that they said they weren't going to take a Sixth Circuit appeal. There were no conflicting cases. The, the, the Fifth Circuit hadn't come out and ruled. So it's not surprising. The Supreme Court gets 10,000 such p- petitions a year. And what really is the bar for whether they take one, oftentimes, not always, is are there two appeals courts at the federal level in conflict? That wasn't the case a few weeks ago. Now it is. I think that changes the dynamic. I think Going back to the first part of your question, what should the pro Heise forces take heart in? I think they should definitely take heart. It's it's a huge quote unquote win for them, or it's a huge check mark in their favor that the Fifth Circuit did say all of the things that they front loaded up at the at the beginning of their ruling before they said that the enforcement mechanism was not constitutional. You know, the, the rulemaking was solved by Congress. The Fifth Circuit said they agreed with the Sixth Circuit on that. It doesn't violate the due process clause. They agreed on that. So there are a lot of things in agreement. There is just that one, you know, you can say that little aspect that's not, but it isn't a little aspect. The enforcement mechanism is huge. It's what the Heise Authority and by extension, HIWU do on a day-to-day basis. I don't think you could go back to Congress and say, hey, rewrite the law again with another tweak that we're going to shove into a budget bill that gets passed at the end of the year, because this one is going to be a little more difficult to tweak from a writing the law standpoint than solving the rulemaking process, which is what got solved by rewriting the law with just a few words in 2022. Katie, one more qu- I'm sorry, Randy. No, um, go ahead. One more question for you. Um, since the court, the one court has said that that the enforcement arm of the uh, Haiza Haiwu is, is something that they don't believe should be proper and, and is legal. What if I, I'm a trainer, I get a positive tomorrow uh, for some bad stuff, and the, you know, the wheels start turning and eventually Haiza wants to, to give me a suspension of two years. Can my lawyers argue that uh, uh, Court of Appeals, Sixth Circuit, uh, Fifth Circuit has ruled that you can't do this? Could this be a, 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 um, an, an avenue or, or a way of uh, you know, uh, clever lawyers try to get these cases thrown out? I'm sure it will be utilized. Whether or not that works, that's the zillion dollar question that I don't have an answer to. You're looking at this thing from 35,000 feet. I mean, look, we all know uh, thoroughbred racing has over the, over the decades has a special affinity for shooting itself in the foot. We've seen it time and time again. I mean, there were other attempts to, uh, to come up with something similar to HISA that have gone on in past decades. And those all seem to end at the legislative level when legislators just threw their hands up and said, look, we we can't get people within horse racing to cooperate. How are we ever going to do something like this? And then finally, things got so bad in thoroughbred racing that Mitch McConnell and others got together and, and just decided, OK, we have to get this done, even though there's so much infighting and we'll 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 deal with that later. And so HISA was born and, and this is where we're at right now. Um we all have strong opinions about it. I know I have strong opinions about it. I don't agree with what the National HBPA is doing. But, you know, I guess in the end, uh, we live in a democracy, right? Uh, there are avenues like this for other well-intentioned people like those in the HBPA and some trainers who disagree with ISA and who strongly believe, as we might strongly believe otherwise, that HISA is not a good thing and that it's unconstitutional. So it's going to go down to the Supreme Court, ultimately, we think, and so be it. But I think they'll prevail. But uh, that's I'm trying to be optimistic, and that's kind of the way I'm looking at it right now. This is the democratic process, and uh, let's get it done, get it over with, and move on. TD, set a line. What's the line on two, two questions? Yes, HISA survives. No, HISA doesn't survive. Three to five, it survives. Six to five, it doesn't. Can you give me your give me your guess? Um, I, I think that uh, 
because I have to objectively report on this, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I, I'm, I'm tantalized and it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. And I do, I do want to give you that number, but because I have to objectively report on this, I'm right. not going to come down on one side or the right. other. But I think the overarching question that I'll be asking in my reporting as this goes on is to what end does the HBPA want to keep fighting this? I mean, what, what is the end game when you, when you add up all of the costs at the time and, as our, Congress, uh, as our uh, constitutional law expert, Lucinda Finley, pointed out in her article in TDN last week, does there come a tipping point where, where even people who are initially supportive of the HBPA's efforts say, hey, geez, some aspects of this are working. It, it, it's, it's ending up uh, ostensibly in safer racing. It's ostensibly ending up with, with cheaters being knocked out of the game. Sure, there is some collateral damage. We've talked about that at length, the three of us on this podcast in different podcasts. But you have to wonder if, if if at some point people say, hey, you know, there is a framework here. Mm -hmm. It's 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 on the way to working. It's not quite where it needs to be. But do we really just want to abandon this and, and, and go with with who knows what else? I mean, that's that, that's going to be the question that needs to be answered. The TD and Writers Room also brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. The PHBA has gone through all of its stats and so far this year, or at least through the end of April 2024, the PHBA has paid breeders awards to 217 different breeders. And at the top of the list in those breeders awards, Uptown Charlie Brown Stud, get this, $223,799 in Breeders' Awards. To get involved in some of that, you can pick up a Pennsylvania bred at a public or private sale. You can race at three different Pennsylvania racetracks. You can race on dirt, turf, tapita. It can be a very good and profitable deal. For any questions, please contact the PHBA. The number is 610-444-1050 or go to pabred.com. The PA Horse Breeders Association presents the new and improved Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Six $100,000 stakes for PA sired PA bred Zoot Parks. Two six furlong contests on PA Derby Day. The two year olds then go seven furlongs on December 30th. The last two races are in August 2025 for three year olds. Then 50,000 in breeder bonuses go to the top three horses in the series. For more, go to pabred.com. Well, Saratoga is upon us. We're taking this on Tuesday. Opening day is Thursday. Um, I thought it'd be fun to just, let's just take a look at this Saturday card and see if uh, our panel of experts can come up with a couple winners. And, you know, it's very typical of what to expect at Saratoga. You have three stakes races on the card, including the Diana, which is a grade one. Some very good betting races. Let's hope the weather holds up. Uh, I've heard conflicting reports about what the weather is going to be this weekend in Saratoga, but uh, boy, N Naira sure deserves a break. Uh, and hopefully they can get sunny skies for their opening weekend. So the Kelso is a grade three, well, one mile on the grass. They moved this race around a lot. And and, and now I guess it, it used to be a one time it was a prep for the Breeders' Cup mile and it became a prep for the um, Cigar Mile. Now I think, imagine it's a prep for the Four Star Dave, but um I made a mistake over the weekend. I actually, uh, for the first time in my life, picked against Charlie Appleby in some races. <laughs> never, never again, never again. In Mysterious Night in the Kelso, uh, you know, he's got Flavian Pratt aboard. The horse, a, a bunch of these horses are coming out of the poker stakes. The winner isn't, but the, I think the second, third, and fourth place finishers. He just looks like the best of, among this group. You know, ran, ran a good race last time out. Didn't particularly seem to have a bad trip. But uh, again, and speaking of uh, stakes race fields, this is a grass stakes race with a $175,000 purse. And they have a field of five. So this is a problem that is not going away. But my pick in the Kelso will be Mysterious Night. You know, when uh, when Charlie Appleby and Godolphin decided to bring a string over here, uh, basically full time for 2024 and a select string and focus on these major stakes races on turf, Saratoga was what they were really pointing at as much as anything else. And so a Mysterious Night is just the first uh, the opening salvo in, in what promises to be a, uh, a very successful and profitable meeting for Appleby uh, and the uh, and the Godolphin clan. What I found interesting, uh, you know, the uh, DRF does its divisional rankings every week, you know, the top three-year-olds, top older horses, top sprinters. In the category of top 
male turf horses, a category that you would think we've been conditioned to think that Chad Brown would tend to dominate. I think it's I think it's six of it's either six of the top seven or six of the top eight in the DRF divisional rankings are all Godolphin trained by Charlie Appleby. It's it's just amazing the strength that these guys have and that is going to come to bear during the Saratoga meet. And uh, I agree, Mysterious Knights, uh, definitely the horse to beat in a disappointingly small field in the Kelso. And if you gave me good enough odds on the, the sun coming up in the West, I'd probably mm -hmm. take a flyer on that. So in that spirit, I'm going to try and beat uh, the Godolphin Appleby horse here. Uh, I, I go with Carl Spackler. Trying to be a little bit of a wise guy here. He's two for three over the inner turf at, at Saratoga. He won the opening verse on uh, Derby weekend at Churchill. Two starts back on the Belmont Stakes Festival up at the spa. He was three wide on both turns in the poker. So just uh, trying to toss a couple of bucks in his direction, hoping to get lucky. And it's one of the coolest names in horse racing, too. Carl Spackler, of course, <laughs> from the Bill Murray character in Caddyshack. All right, so we go to the big feature of the day. That's the Diana, grade one, 500,000. And, you know, every year we're faced with the same dilemma. Okay, Chad Brown, but which Chad Brown? He's won this race eight times, six of the last seven runnings, and has five horses in this race. Randy um, and TD, isn't this the race last year, the year before he ran one, two, three, four in? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, obviously, Chad Brown is somebody that you have to take a big look at. And among his horses, uh, I'm not saying other people can't win, but I kind of like White Beam, who won this race last year. It's coming off a second place finish in the Just a Game at a mile, uh, stretches out a little bit, a mile and an eighth here. And uh, this horse is, hasn't been a, necessarily a winning machine. It's only won, hasn't won since uh, J July of 23. But there's very little pace in this race. And I think Fabian Pratt can take advantage of that. I don't know if this horse is going to go right to the front. But this horse will be forwardly placed with a slow pace up front. And I think that's all the kind of break that this horse is going to need to give Chad Brown his ninth win in the Diana Stakes. Yeah, I, I purposely, I, I have to admit, I, I don't play these type of races either in a, a pick three or a pick four sequence. I don't play, meaning I don't play the type of races where one trainer loads up with almost half the field. It's just inscrutable to me. So Chad Brown having five of the 11 entrants here uh, is probably a race that personally I will not realistically play. But for trying to be a, a public handicapper wise guy, again, we'll go with a little bit of a price horse in here. Mission of Joy for Graham Motion, winless in over a year. However, tantalizingly close uh, at odds of 13 to 1, 14 to 1, 25 to 1, beaten a half length, a length, two lengths. Um, perhaps Saturday will be the day. At a price. So, all right, looking at this, obviously, I put my handicapper hat on, which uh, I put on quite frequently. Um, yes, White Beam will be uh, advantaged by a likely slow pace in the Diana, but she was also advantaged by a very slow pace in her last race in the Just a Game. But Chili Flag, her stablemate, went from last to first despite the super slow pace and had this huge kick, which she displayed in her previous two starts as well, and uh, rolled past White Beam in the late stages. So I, she went the last quarter, by the way, in that race in 22.12 seconds. Last mile, the last 16th of a mile, five and four. Um, this mare, five year old mare, has just a remarkable stretch burst, even with no pace in the race. So I see no reason if the just a game was at a mile and now the Diana is at a mile and an eighth, why Chili Flag wouldn't be even more effective. But what's interesting to me here is, so Chad's got five of the eight horses in the race. He's won it, what'd you say, eight times? Yep. He might not be the favorite. Didia on paper looks like she mm -hmm. might wind up being the post time favorite. I think it's going to be close between Didia and Chili Flag just because of the Chad Brown factor. But uh, I mean, Didia is in fantastic form. She won the Pegasus Philly and Mare. She's coming off a win in the New York at the Saratoga meet at a mile and three sixteenths. Now she shortens up, but that hasn't been a problem for her in the past. She's won 11 out of 17 races. She's hitting on all cylinders. So, uh, and Moira is no slouch either, but she hasn't had a race this year yet. Uh, it's a fantastic race and it doesn't necessarily have to go Chad Brown's way. 
We shall see. It usually does in Saratoga in the turf races for, especially for Phillies. So 11th race is the Sanford and it's starting to get exciting. You know, there's many, many, many two-year-olds yet to come. We'll have five or six maiden winners during the meet. We'll, we'll, we'll be rising, TDN rising stars and everybody will be talking about them. And the story, of course, in the Sanford is Menti, the full brother to fierceness, who won first time out by a mere nose. But the buyer figure is an 88. That's the highest figure of any two-year-old uh, in the country so far, right, Randy? Yes. Menti, okay. Um, so, you know, that horse has a lot of upside and it will be a deserving favorite. I'm going to try to beat him, though, with Studley Do-Right, the horse that shipped in from Maryland to win the Tremont Stakes. This horse had a really, you know, his number's an 82. So he's in the ballpark. That's the second fastest number in the race. And I really liked his last race in the Tremont. He he was pretty far back. Didn't look like he had much of a chance. And he just really turned in an explosive stretch kick uh, to get there in time to win from the Maryland connection. So obviously Menti is the horse to watch. And it'll, it'll be very curious, too, to see if Menti starts running bad races every other race. You know, is it something <laughs> wrong in the, the genes of these poor horses? Um, so but if he's like his brother, this is his race that he's gonna, not going to run in. But uh, anyway, Studley do right for me. Yeah, his brother fierceness, obviously. Um, look, I, it, the only way I could pick against Menti in this spot would be if Colloquial uh, came back to run against him again. Colloquial was the uh, equally talented horse that ran in that same maiden race at Belmont at Aqueduct on June the 15th and finished just a nose behind Menti and was eating up ground late. You can make the case, like all trainers always do. Uh, Menti was a uh, coasting. He was out there by himself. Uh, he was lost. He was getting distracted. All these other excuses that people come up with. Um, but Colloquial is not in this race. And so therefore, I think Minty has a huge talent edge over the field, um, even over Studley Do-Ride, I think. So I think it's going to be awfully tough to beat Minty in this spot. And as a testament to the age in which we live, how odd is it to look at the past performances for opening weekend of Saratoga and see that there are two-year-olds who have already started at Saratoga because a couple of these horses did come out of the Tremont Stakes on the Belmont Stakes Festival of Racing. So that, that was a little bit of an odd quirk when I tried to decipher the race. I landed on three echoes in here. Uh, he was third in the Tremont. Had a little bit of a rough trip for a very short race. He, he broke in and bumped at the break, but he quickly recovered vied at the rail inside of the favorite. Uh, the favorite looked like he was getting away from him at the top of the lane. They both went kind of wide. Three echoes cut back down inside, actually got in front at the eighth pole, was put in a little bit tight, probably didn't cost him anything at the 16th pole. And then Bill's horse uh, came lumbering on by to pick, to pick them both up at the wire. But I, I think uh, three echoes has the speed enough to pressure and be a pace presence. And I think he's going to benefit from that race over the track and he'll stick out the trip. So while we're on the topic of two-year-olds, uh, this is not a Saratoga topic, at least not yet, but I want to roll out one more horse here to put on your radar screen. Uh, and he's been flying, or she has been flying very much under the radar. There is a two-year-old filly that just won the uh, at Prairie Meadows in a stakes race this past weekend. Her name is White Sands. She's owned by the Coolmore Group. She's trained by Wesley Ward. She's had two lifetime starts. She broke her maiden at Belterra by nine and a half. Then they ran her against boys at Prairie Meadows in a stake. She won by 13 and three quarters in that race. Uh, she's got one eye in a, uh, in a, in a, as a foal uh, in an accident. She lost her right eye. She really doesn't know any better because she was just a baby when it happened. But her next start will probably be at Saratoga. So White Sands is a horse to put on your radar screen. She also happens to be a half sister to Jackie's warrior. So speed runs in the family. I, you just giving me a good idea for a TDN story. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> there, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, well, anyways, that's opening week at Saratoga. There are obviously other big races, but I just wanted to focus in on those three. Now we had talked earlier about Menti, the who's going to be the favorite in the Sanford. He is the XBTV work of the week. Menti is. He's the half brother to Fierceness by City of Light, who broke his maiden on his debut on June fifteenth at Belmont at the Big A. Menti worked four furlongs in forty nine point oh five on Sunday in Saratoga in company with unlimited potential. Trainer Todd Pletcher said that Menti will head next to San stakes this Saturday, July 13th at Saratoga. We'll be right back after this message from Mexican TV.
all the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. We always like to talk about West Point Thoroughbreds because, after all, West Point is a sponsor of the TDN Writers Room. It was another week, another stakes win for West Point. This time it was Saturday's grade three, six and a half furlong Hendry stakes at Woodbine, where Gal in a rush appeared to be in no rush whatsoever until she approached the stretch of the Hendry. Then she went from last to first for her first stakes win and West Point's 13th stakes win this year alone. She's a ghost sapper filly trained by Christophe Clement, was ridden by Kazushi Kimura. Then there's Saratoga. This week, West Point has three runners in the first three days of the week, including Northern Invader going against Mysterious Night in Saturday's Kelso Stakes. Another track opening this week is Colonial Downs, where on Saturday, West Point's integration looks like a solid favorite in the million preview stakes, as in Arlington Million for trainer Shook McGahee. And we know integration loves Colonial Downs. To find out how you can be a part of all this action, visit westpointtb.com. Well, that's a wrap for this week's show. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank my partners, Randy Moss and T.D. Thornton. And by the way, the story on Zoe, apparently her car broke down on the way to Saratoga. She's stranded. I'm not, I'm not making this up. She got stranded in Utah. <laughs> Utah. <laughs> we, her, car, her car broke down on the way to Saratoga. So she must be like in New Jersey, right? Yeah. <laughs> Utah. <laughs> so... Let's hope, let's hope she makes it there by Traverse Day. So, and it broke down on so holiday Zoe. weekend, on 4th of July weekend, and she couldn't find anybody to work on it. Oh, poor Zoe. Well, uh, she'll be back, I'm sure, next week. But Petey, as usual, did a great job. We thank him for uh, filling in. want to thank the Green Group guests of the week, David O'Rourke, and our producers, Katie Petruniak, Anthony LaRocca, and Aaliyah LaRocca. Thanks for joining us. Check up with you again next week on the TDN Writers Room Podcast. 